Thank you for coming to the final Free Market Institute lecture of the semester. I'm Brian Kutzinger, and I am the Assistant Director of the Free Market Institute at ASU and a Professor of Economics in the Norris Vincent College of Business. I'm excited that despite COVID-19, we have the opportunity to continue our mission of providing educational programming related to the free enterprise system and the institutional environment necessary for it to function well. I'd like to thank my colleagues in the College of Business for their support of the Free Market Institute and the administrative team at the Institute for all the work they do to make events like this possible, especially an event like this where we have to do uh, some live streaming. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Van Skin, who is the Chief Economist at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, a nonpartisan free market think tank based in Austin. He is an expert on economic and fiscal issues and his research focuses on identifying opportunities that enable people to prosper in Texas and beyond. Dr. Ginn is the former Associated Director, Associate Director, excuse me, of Economic Policy for the Office of Management and Budget at the Executive Office of the President, and he holds a PhD in Economics from Texas Tech University. And one real quick programming note, please be sure to put your questions in the comment section on Facebook or YouTube so Dr. Ginn has a chance to address those questions at the end of his talk. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ginn to Angela State University. Well, thank you, Brian. It's a pleasure to be with you. And thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. I look forward to visiting with you in per person, uh, person soon, <laughs> uh, instead of through Zoom. Uh, but I'm glad we have this opportunity. Some of the innovation that's been able to take place gives us this opportunity today, and it's a, it's a blessing to do so. Um, so it's great to be with everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and put my screen here up and share my screen um, so you can see that. And um, so my title today of my presentation is, Was the Cure Worse Than COVID-19? So there's a lot that goes into that, and I hope to um, give a good overview of, of that today. So let's see, sure that it would go forward here. One second. There we go. All right. So um, as Brian said, I, I work at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, which is a 501c3 nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, research institute here in Austin, Texas. And uh, we, we basically work to pr promote and defend liberty, personal responsibility, and free enterprise in Texas and really across the nation. Um, I've had the opportunity to be here off and on now for seven years. And I even did an internship here in 2011. So it's, a, it's been a great place to not only just be a think tank, but really a do tank to where we're trying to get things done, to have good government put in place that allows for there to be reduced barriers from, from government and, and overall more prosperity. Um, kind of my hashtag that I like to use is let people prosper. And I think that, that in, kind of encapsulates a lot of what we do here at the foundation at the state local, and even at the federal level. You can check us out more at texaspolicy.com. And, and so getting into the discussion today about COVID-19 and what's all been happening is, I think it's important to, to make sure that we, we know what we're starting off with here, right? And because there's a lot of information, there's a, there's a lot of noise, if you will, and rhetoric that's put out there that I think we need to take into consideration to be able to understand where we've been, where we're at now and where we need to go you know, moving forward. And, and, I, and I hope to present that today. But I think one place to really start is, is to make sure that we have humility as we go through thinking about these, these different issues. Um, you know, there, there's First Peter 5, 6 that says, humble yourselves overall to the Lord. And I think that's an important point about this is to make sure that we are humble and, and have that humility. And when I look at some of the economists that have been out there throughout time and say, all right, well, where are they at on this? Uh, when you look at Frederick Hayek, who is one of my favorite economists, who said the curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. It shows that humility that's there. And we've got to be careful about what we're trying to design overall. And I think whether it be politicians, whether it be us as just uh, people in the public or experts, um, that are thinking about what we should be doing, it's very important to consider that. And then someone who is on the other side of the economic spectrum, when you think about government, the role for government and how much it should play was John Maynard Keynes. And, and he even said, practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. <laughs> so, so again, we've got to make sure that we're careful about the next steps that we're taking. And, and, and so today, what I hope to provide is my perspective of where we've been, 
and, and, and where we're going. Um, and, and, and a lot of that starts off with how institutions matter. That's a big part of my kind of economic thinking, um, and I'll get into some more of that here in a minute. But I think it's important to think about these in different institutional settings. When you think about political institutions, economic institutions, and social institutions. And so I found this nice Venn diagram uh, chart here from the systems thinker that I think does a pretty good job of putting these into place. When you think about political systems, you're thinking about your republic like we have here in America, your authoritarian sort of governments, your dictatorships, democracies, and so forth, right? Those are your types of political systems that you have. Um, you could also think of though that the note within those political systems, they're there to provide private property rights, for example. But you also have your social institutions. When, and, and in there, you know, you have your community-based organizations, your civil society. But I also think of the individual, the families, the neighborhoods, right? Kind of moving further and further out uh, of that. And your churches, your nonprofits, things of that nature that are going to work within those social institutions. And then, of course, you have your economic institutions. And the economic institutions, you could have a range from capitalism, right, to uh, socialism and, and others that are within that spectrum. And so there's some sort of combination where all these are coming together that we need to take into consideration. And, and when, you, when you look at each one of these, I think it makes a lot of sense. And so if, I wanted to start here with institutions matter because it goes into everything else that I, I want to discuss today. And I, and I think it's, if you're looking at your social institutions, when government begins to grow and grows too fast uh, compared with other sectors of our, of our society, then what they can often do is crowd out, right? Those are sectors of society. And in fact, they can crowd out our natural rights to liberty. And, and so when we think about liberty, it, it, to me, it's not just something that we have, it's a natural right that we have. And it's an important for the role of government to be that they are there to preserve liberty. And so when we're thinking about any sort of policy implications and what the effects are on, of COVID and things of that nature, which the effects of COVID are, are real, right? These are things that are influencing people's lives each and every day, which I'm going to go through some of those metrics today, um, you know, for my sister and other family members who have had it, um, and, and, and some families who, who, who maybe someone of their loved ones has, has, has died from it. I mean, there's, there's some major uh, consequences to the disease itself, and so I'm not trying to downplay any of that within this discussion today, but it is important to understand the importance of the institutions and then the trade-offs that we face every day. And I think even for you and, and for me, we think about the mental model, the lens with which we see the world. Is, and, and, and within that lens, there is an institutional framework that happens over time um, that, can, that, can trade, that can trade off what, what's going to happen as far as the, uh, the, the different sectors of your life. Sorry, I had a light that was going off. That's why it took me a second there. Um, but you know, it, it, in my background, I had the opportunity from kindergarten to second grade to go to a small private school. From third grade to sixth grade, I went to a public school. And from seventh grade through 12th grade, I went to homeschool. That gave me different lenses with which to see the world. Um, I played in a band for a few years, in a hard rock band, and that gave me a lens to see the world. I was in a major car accident um, in 2002 that kind of changed my perspective of, of the world that we live in. And then I got to go to Texas Tech University the first generation college student and, and graduate there with my PhD in economics. that gave me some opportunities that I wouldn't have otherwise had. And that also helped me to have the lens that I see the world today with the, the worldview and the different uh, uh, training that, I, that I've had. Um, and then I started here at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, worked a lot on fiscal policy, tax policy or taxes and, and spending, uh, spending restraint, spending limits, which is very important because that's really the the tax on us, that's really the burden of government is the amount that it spends. And so th those sort of lenses are, are very important of how I see the world. I'm sure you've went through a lot yourself. Um, and then last year I had the, the great opportunity to work at the White House. As Brian said earlier, I was Associate Director for Economic Policy um, at the Office of Management and Budget within the White House. At the, so I was at the Eisenhower Executive Office Building just next door to the White House. And so over that year, I had a great opportunity to work on the president's budget, come up with economic assumptions. Um, there was a little thing called an impeachment that went on for a little while. And then, you know, COVID-19 hit. And so I was there right when all that stuff started happening. And you could see the spread of it over time, you know, from China, places in Europe, to Seattle, up in Washington, and then expanding, and then keeping track of a lot of those figures. And so 
that gave me another perspective of how things were going to happen and also see it in real time, what the policy implications were and what those were gonna be. And so, you know, I feel blessed with those sort of lenses, but it also gives me a perspective that I hope I can share today that will hope, hopefully help you to give some insight as well um, along the way. And so institutions matter. And, and there's a long line of, of literature within economics talking about institutional economics. Um, there's mainline economics where you look at, you know, Adam Smith, Frederick Hayek, James Buchanan, Douglas North, and others that, that basically gives you a line of the importance of institutions and the, the importance of the knowledge that's gained within the feedback mechanisms of each one of these institutions, and in particular with markets and, and you know, capitalism, um, being able to support so much economic growth and prosperity uh, for, for, for a, couple of, a couple of centuries now, right? And I think that's essential for us to be able to reduce poverty and get people to fulfill whatever their dream it may be, uh, would be very important. Yeah, James Buchanan, which is also, has also been very influential in my thinking about the amount of rent seeking that takes place, where we, not, we, we need not just understand what's happening in the private sector, but also the thinking of government officials, right? As they have different incentives compared to the incentives that are in the private sector, where in the private sector, you have a system of profit and loss. In government, you don't have that same sort of feedback mechanism. So oftentimes what we do is we say, okay, here's the budget. And now we have this budget inertia where just increases time after time. And maybe even if there's a program that's not effective, well, what's the answer? It's not to eliminate it or reduce it. It's oftentimes to expand it, right? You get spend more money on it. And that oftentimes can, can be in the, um, at the expense of, of, of more economic growth within the productive private sector. And you also have Douglas North, who also did a lot of great work on the, the institutional changes that take place that allow for more economic growth and prosperity over time. And I think a lot of that's in, in, encapsulated within the work by Osamoglu and Robinson in Why Nations Fail. And um, I think I rec probably recommend that book. They look, they look out throughout hum uh, history of, uh, of different countries and their effects of, of, how, what, of how institutions have played a role within um, society, within government and within the economy overall. And they really kind of break it down nicely into extractive institutions, those that are taking from some to give to others, like socialism, right? You're extracting, you're taking some resources from some to give to others. Authoritarianism does that as well. Those sort of, those sort of types of institutions that tend to lead to more poverty, right? And a concentration of power into the hands of the few being mostly government compared to the masses and the public at large. And, and just socialism in particular, right, is the, the ownership of the means of capital by, by society or really government. Um, and so the, already you're, con you're, you're putting more power into the hands of a few people. Whereas on the other side, you have inclusive institutions. Inclusive institutions are those that support more economic growth and prosperity um, and, and, and more liberty overall, right? Prosperity, when I say of that word, I'm not necessarily meaning you know, material prosperity, but spiritual prosperity, mental prosperity, a lot of other ways to look at it compared to just that material nature. And so that's where you think about capitalism, republics, democracies, those sort of things that allow for there to be a foundation for people to have an equal opportunity to build their life, right? And move up the economic ladder, which is something that's, that's great here in the United States of America. And so when we look at these different institutions, I think what's important to see these as well is to figure out how do we, what do we look at these different institutions, all right? Um, one way is to look at the different policies by different presidents and things of that nature, right? And so this next slide here looks at the significant final role, rules, uh, basically regulations by presidential year, excluding deregulatory actions. And so what you'll, you'll see is that there are some economically significant rules and others that are not significant. Um, but one of the things that under the Trump administration was that they really wanted to, we really wanted to work on deregulating things, right? Reducing the barriers overall. Um, out of the lives of, of people to hopefully allow for more flourishing to take place. And just at least from the number of significant rules, um, the last three years were some of the least amount, at least since 2001. I think you would go much further than that. Um, that's just what was provided here in this particular table by the Council of Economic Advisors. But this contributed to more economic flourishing, to where you can have better feedback mechanisms, to where the prices can better reflect what consumers should purchase and what suppliers should produce. Right? And that allows for that feedback and that mechanism to take place, which is kind of the beauty of capitalism and, and, and kind of free market economics overall. And I, and I think that's helped to bring about more economic growth. 
there was an, a, a nice study done by the Council of Economic Advisors that looked at just the deregulations by the Trump administration um, have, could amount to about $220 billion or $3,100 for an average household, right? $3,100 more dollars in your pocket, which is important when you're thinking about where should power really lie? Should power in the hands of the, of, 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 of the people, right? And, and so when we're thinking about that, it, that's, that's very important. Um, and and how does, what, does that, what does that mean, right? Well, when we look at real median household income by householder race um, overall here in this, this next slide, this is annual household income. Um, it's adjusted, so this is real inflation adjusted dollars. Um, what you'll notice is that real median in household incomes have continued to go up over time, but there was a flat line for quite a while. But over the last three, four years, it has been increasing pretty rapidly. And in fact, if you look at all races, it's up about $6,000, which is interesting because you have the Council of Economic Advisors say, look, if we have this deregulation take place, our estimates show additional $3,100 in real median household income. And there was also the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, which their estimates show that it would be about a $2,900 increase in real household income. $3,100 and $2,900, that's $6,000 increase in real household income. That's the same amount that we've experienced just in, just in the last three years. And so we've already started to see the benefits of, of, of those institutional changes, what I would call them, that have moved more to, towards inclusive um, setups that allow for more economic prosperity, that get in the hands of, of real people. And I think that's what's important. It's not just to think about GDP growth and things of that nature. Those are important measures to consider, but really what we want are people to be able to prosper more. Um, and this is for all the, all the different um, in, income groups by, by race. Um, you also look at poverty rates. So what have poverty been doing? Well, poverty has also been on the decline. Real household income had reached a record in 2019, okay? The poverty record high, uh, the poverty rate reached a record low. And so that's an essential part of this is to put more hands and in, 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 in put more money into your hands, right? Put people in charge compared with putting government in charge and having more extractive sorts of institutions. Um, so I think that was another important thing through 2019. We're getting to some of the 2020 stuff. But I just want to give you an idea of where we were. Um, if you look at unemployment by different groups, uh, a lot of those reached record lows under the last three years. Um, and so I think that was also an essential part. And, and that was even in, in spite of what the Congressional Budget Office said back in 2016, was they had very slow growth in job creation and things of that nature. And so if you compare that to what actually happened, there was substantially hot, faster um, economic growth and job creation, and therefore more prosperity than what some of those estimates would initially, or, or what they found before those um, changes, those institutional changes went into place. This also helped to deal with some of the income inequality uh, effects over time. So this looks at 2009 to 2019. So from the last expansion, basically the, the whole last expansion between the Obama years and the Trump years. And what you'll notice is that on the Obama years, managers, upper income earners, earned faster than workers, lower income workers on average, whereas under the Trump years, it was the reverse. Same thing when you look at the levels of education. What's interesting too is the bottom 10% had a faster increase in their earnings than the top 10% of the Trump years compared with the Obama years, which was the opposite, meaning that there was higher, there was increased income inequality under the Obama years compared to a decreased income inequality uh, under the Trump years. And a similar thing happened with African Americans and whites. And so I think what this shows is that there is something important with the institutional framework. Whether you agree you know, with everything that the Trump administration did or with Trump himself, I mean, I think put that to the side, let's think about what's best for people. And, and I hope that you know, this sort of thing will be taken into account as new institutional changes and new policies are considered for the future. And this was also goes into net worth, where you had growth in real net worth at the bottom 50% growing substantially faster under the Trump administration compared to the prior three administrations. Um, and a similar thing goes when the share of net worth for the top 1% actually declining uh, for those couple of years for the, the Trump administration, whereas they increased dramatically under the Obama years, and the bottom 50% actually had an increase, again, in real net worth. And so I think that's another thing that puts more money into the power of the people instead of power of government or expanding the welfare state and things of that nature. And so I bring this up because I really want us to show the importance of institutions. I'm going to keep coming back to that over time, um, but, but I think this is important here. So my second key point is trade-offs matter. I think this is one of the number one uh, 
lessons that I would teach in economics is the, uh, the idea of opportunity cost. The next best alternative to whatever action that you're taking is your opportunity cost. So think about what, you, what you'd rather be doing right now than watching me here on Zoom. Probably a lot of things, okay? <laughs> uh, I know I'd, I'd probably rather be spending time with my two young boys um, and, and things of that nature. However, I'm here. This is my rational decision that I'm making. This is the action that I'm taking. So my opportunity cost is, is that I'm giving up time with my boys, right? Um, and so there, there's, there's no free lunch, as Milton Friedman would say. There's, there's not, nothing is free. As long as there's a scarce resource, it can't be free because there's always something that you're giving up. And these, those are these opportunity costs. And we need to figure out how we're going to maximize our level of, of utility or a level of satisfaction. We need to think about the effects of externalities, whether or not we should save, how inflation affects us. There are all these trade-offs that go into the actions that we take every day. And, and nothing really came to light more than that, I would say, at least here recently, than the COVID-19 situation and the, um, the novel coronavirus, right, as it spread across the U.S. and took hold and put a burden on our hospital system. And so that gets into us into more of the discussion that we're in today. Um, and so you, as, you'll, as you'll think about this, I mean, it seems kind of forever ago now, but this was in early March, right, when things really started to, to spread out and the contagion effects started to happen across the United States of America. And there, there were people who, you know, stopped going to work. Some businesses said, you know what, we're going to shut down for a while. The NBA, for example, um, they shut down. And, and then there was um, discussion, you know, within the White House of, okay, what should be our next steps? And, and the choice really was to make this a more of a guidance sort of policy, right? Where you had the social distancing put in place, the idea of, you know, should you be wearing a mask and probably be a good idea for your own, your own safety and those, are, those around you sort of idea. Um, and, 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 and thinking about how to best deal with something that we haven't had to deal with for a very long time. It's a very complex situation. I mean, in economics, we talk about externalities. There were these, there were these negative externalities, something that was affecting negatively an innocent bystander, such as a no, novel coronavirus, okay? So the, uh, if I'm breathing, breathing out or coughing, um, you might be infected by that, right? And so that could be in that way of externality. And so in the private market, some would say there was a market failure because it's not internalizing this, this social cost this negative externality. And so we need to figure out some sort of other policies to be able to internalize that. Some could usually do it with a price or something like that, but that's difficult to do in this situation. Some have with putting, you know, fines and fees on people if they don't wear a mask, for example, with the mask mandates. Um, we'll get to that more in a, in a little bit. Um, but, but another way to think about it is how do we deal with the hospital capacity issue? Because if somebody's infected, what we notice is that in particular groups of people in certain demographics were more susceptible and vulnerable to this overall. And many of them were being put in a situation where they needed to go to the hospital for breathing concerns or other things that were there. And so it put a lot of stress on the hospital capacity. And so there was this idea of flattening the curve. And that's what this um, slide shows here. And the idea was, is okay, if we have active cases that are rising, if we don't have mitigation or some sort of mitigation technique that, uh, or, or policy, then we're gonna have a large number of active cases and then that will overwhelm hospital capacity, right? Too many people for few, too few beds and we don't have a pricing mechanism, so we gotta do something else. And so the idea was, okay, let's look at flattening the curve to not overwhelm has, hospital capacity. And, and that's where we started seeing that some states and local governors, uh, state governors and local officials started to lock down or shut down um, their society, close businesses, right? Stay indoors for two weeks and those sort of things to try to flatten the curve while at the same time, hopefully increasing hospital capacity over time. And, 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 and so if you could flatten the curve while increasing hospital capacity, we won't overwhelm hospitals and therefore put us in a better position to better handle COVID-19 and hopefully help the economy to bounce back faster over time. At least in theory, okay, that was the idea. And that is the idea. As many states now are starting to look at this again as cases have started to increase, um, this is really where it comes down to. And the question is, if it didn't work then, right, why would we think it would work this time around? Or another way to put it, it even if it worked last time, it's back now, would we, are we willing to take that same, the same costs? 
are the marginal costs greater than the marginal benefits? And that's something I'd like to discuss more, more today, right? So the trade-offs, here's a nice matrix, kind of busy, right? But the McKinsey and company have this trade-offs between the, uh, looking at the global economy and the different scenarios for COVID-19's impact on GDP, you have your virus spread and public health response on the y-axis going up and down, and then you have the knock-on effects and economic policy response on the x-axis. And so if you can be all the way to A4, the virus is contained and you have a strong re growth rebound. Or if you're in B3, you have a pandemic escalation, prolonged downturn without economic recovery. So the idea is to find the, ha the happy medium. Um, the way that people answered this within this particular survey was that, they, that A1, the virus occurrence, slow long-term growth, muted world recovery. Um, and, and so that's something that we're looking at. But what this really shows is that there's going to be some trade-off. You're going to have a trade-off between trying to mitigate COVID-19 and the spread and a reduction in economic activity overall. And so which one of these will tend to win out over time? And, and look, it's not a, um, a net zero effect overall either, right? Because if you slow down the economy, that also puts entrepreneurs to the sidelines if you lock down, right? And, and entrepreneurs are really the way that we get this feedback mechanism to work so they can innovate. And innovation creates more productive capacity for us to then expand and deal with problems like we have throughout much of human history, right? Is using those new capital and new innovations to be, to be able to overcome obstacles like a COVID-19. What's interesting is that we've never shut down our economy to this extent before, not nowhere near this extent, but yet we've been able to overcome many of these obstacles before. Again, looking at the trade-offs that are there. And look, there was a state policy network did answer the, uh, did a survey answering this question here of many people. And basically they found that 85% of people are concerned about government power, right? And, and this is a key situation of looking at the trade-offs now with the amount of power that governments have. And there's even talk, you know, um, by President like, you know, Biden and what's going on there and what the situation is of, of, of whether or not there, there could be a, more, a larger expansion in, in masks in a, in a federal response overall. You know, I think within the Trump administration, there was already a federal response. Um, it was more about guidance and, and with our system of federalism, allowing for more local control instead of more at the national level. And that is, will continue to be a, uh, a serious point of discussion as we move forward. Um, and within these institutions and thinking about the trade-offs, you know, we, we do have different institutions across the, across the globe where you have some that are free to, to not much freedom. And the Economic Freedom of the World put out by the Fraser Institute um, does a good job of looking at different measures. When you look at government spending and taxes and regulations, um, the, the, the currency, the strength of the currency and, and, and trade. Um, the United States ranks the sixth most free according to their latest report. Um, but this kind of gives you an idea of the different institutional frameworks that is across the globe and how different countries might respond to the expansion and the contagion effect of COVID-19. And so what I did here was looked at it, our world and data to kind of plot out what's, what's happened over time. And so this is the seven day rolling average of, of, of looking at the cases per million of COVID-19. When you look at the European Union, so the, the big countries over in Europe, you have the uh, United States, so here, and you also have Sweden, which Sweden was one of those countries that didn't lock down, didn't have some of the same approaches as like we did here in the US, and, and, and some of the European Union even had a, a, a stronger or a more strict sort of lockdown than we did here. And, and what you'll notice is that there was an early rise in the COVID cases in March. We remember that, right? It's a lot of the stress that people were having and, and things of that nature. Um, it, it, it dropped down for a while in the United States as some of the lockdowns and other things went into place, but also just people reacting to it more within the private sector and, and saying, you know what, I'm going to take more precautions myself. I think that's part of the social institutions that I mentioned earlier, where we really need to think about how do we strengthen those to where we're helping each other out thinking what's in the best interest of each other compared to a top-down approach of more government inter intervention. Um, but you'll also notice that, I'm oh, sorry, and so you see the, the drop down in the United States, that red line, then it comes back up again and over the summer as we here in Texas um, experienced that, that rise in the summer, then went back down and now we're coming back again as there has been this increasing number of cases across the, across the United States. Um, you could also see that in European Union as they've also come back up 
even with their mask mandates and things of that nature. Um, and then in Sweden, it's backed up as well. So, um, and, and, and I should know that these are higher than what they've been before. So this is a pretty substantial expansion or uh, infection that we're seeing. And so the question is, what are the trade-offs involved moving forward? Now, if you look at daily new confirmed COVID-19 deaths per million, we saw this huge spike in the early period. And I think that there's some evidence to show, or at least to think about, um, that the case numbers were, were, were likely much higher than what I just reported in that previous slide, but there also wasn't the same amount of testing, right? So we weren't testing as many people as we are um, over time. And, and, and so we didn't cap capture all the cases that were there, especially when you consider how many deaths there were um, from this chart. And so we saw the, the spike in deaths and we saw there was also a large increase in hospitalizations at that time. That tended to go down over, you know, back in June, July, stayed a little bit elevated in, in the United States. And then we've, it, then it's, it's come back up some here recently. But even with the large number of case increases from that previous slide in the United States, European Union, and Sweden, we haven't seen the same sort, sort of deaths per million, which hopefully, uh, pray to God that will be the case, that we will continue not see the same. So there seems to be some sort of difference here, because look, every life is precious. And so we've got to make sure that we are following a sort of policy prescription that's trying to get the best out of each person to make sure that we don't get into a situation where a vast number of people are, are, are dying, while at the same time not being overly aggressive with those policies to try to, to try to internalize those social costs, but make it even worse in the private sector so that we can't fulfill um, not only our livelihoods, right, in our lives, but also not to make sure that we have the extra costs of the additional deaths from suicides, from deaths of heart attacks that we're getting checks and the pre-screenings from cancer. So there's a lot of trade-offs that are involved here. But I think it's important to look at these two slides because the cases per million are, are, are much higher today than they were in the earlier periods of this pandemic. But now the deaths are nearly as high. And I hope that will be the case from an increasing number of therapeutics better hospital capacity and measures that are taking. And so I think there's a lot of good things that are going, going on there, but hopefully we'll continue, to I mean, we'll continue to watch this and hopefully we'll not continue to see this and we can see a peak sooner rather than later. And there's also economic freedom of North America. When you look at the different most free to least free here in the United States, Texas is, no, is number four. Of course, we like to be number one in Texas, so we're not quite the most free. We've still got some things that we need to do there. Um, but, but, but at least we're part of the most free states. And again, this also looks at the areas that are more likely to lock down than not. They put in mask mandates, it's not always one for one, but it's something else to look at from the Fraser Institute. Here are some of the restrictions that have been put in place um, across the US, according to the New York Times. When you look at businesses, um, the ones that are mostly open, kind of in the bluish color, mixed is the grayish color, mostly closed, kind of the, the orangish color there, at least that's the way my eyes are looking at these colors. Uh, and New Mexico is the only one that's mostly closed as of, as of today, but you see that, that there's still um, many places where businesses aren't open. In, in Texas, according to your hospitalization rates across the state, um, you could be up to as much as 75% open. The problem is, is that many businesses with those social distancing rules that are in place can't even open up to 75%. So it's, it's restricting how much um, opportunity that they have to open up and then expand their revenue and hire more workers in the process. You also have the mask mandates. I mean, there are a lot of states that already have mandatory mask mandates um, that are shown there again in the orange, Texas being one, right? We've had a mask mandate since July 2nd, statewide mask mandate. And so um, some say we need a, a mask mandate, but we already have that and, and cases are continuing to rise. Um, stay at home orders, we don't have those as much across the U.S. as we once did. New Mexico recently did this in order of curfew, um, but other states are considering that. And, and, and so that's something we may continue to expand, um, see expand. I hope that won't be the case because of the cost that has the economic lives and livelihoods. I know uh, the director of the Free Market Institute up at, Te at Texas Tech University, my friend uh, Ben Powell, talked about how the economic effects of that would be devastating, and it really would. We saw the economic effects from the earlier situation and, and, and compounding that would be a, a horrible situation to have that now. Um, here's an, an overview of the mask use in Texas. So some are saying we need more mask use. Well, remember July 2nd was when the statewide mask mandate went, in, went into place. So even before that, going back into March, many people on their own volition said, you know what, I'm gonna start wearing a mask. And that shows the, the um, marginal cost, marginal benefit of acting rationally, given the situation that was in place, 
people chose to do that. And so you saw an increase in March and April all the way up to 60%. Um, in July, it did increase a little bit more up to 70% and kind of has flatlined there. And so maybe some people want it to go up to 80, 90 to 100%, but that's when you have to have a, a better maybe enforcement mechanism to really internalize more of those social costs. But of course, that, that sort of enforcement mechanism comes at a higher cost as well. So we've got to be able to have those exchanges. Uh, or trade-offs there. Social mobility in Texas took a huge dive in, in March um, compared to where we were, about a 50% drop-off according to cell phone data that IHME looks at. Um, we started to see some expansion in May, right? So we overcorrected probably in March and April, then it came back some. Um, and then, but then we've kind of stayed flatlined between around 20% the rest of the period, which is why many places Still don't seem like they're as open as they otherwise would be, even given some of the recent government executive orders from the governor. Um, and so that still shows what I think is some of the fear that's out there. Um, and, and, so, and, and so even with the expansion or the, the reduction of these restrictions, some of these are still in place. So something else to look at. So here's some of the picture of what we're looking at at COVID-19 in Texas. The daily new confirmed cases saw that spike, right? So it's pretty low in the early parts. Uh, of, of the pandemic it spiked during the summer. And, and then it's that, that line is a seven day average, okay? And now it's started to come back again. And at the bottom of the screen, you'll see fatalities by de date of death. And so we had this huge spike over the summer, um, but we haven't seen the same rate as cases have increased at the number of de de deaths so far that are recorded. Um, that could increase, you know, because they are doing it by date of, de of death uh, on the certificates. Right, so that could be uh, backfilled later on with deaths, but at this time there hasn't been that same um, 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 trade-off there, uh, same relationship, and and I hope that is the case from better therapeutics and everything else. So it's something else to consider to move forward. Testing is up quite a bit in Texas, so this is seven-day average. Um, we're up to over 100,000 tests per day. Um, there was a point in time where the government was using testing data and the positivity test rate as a metric for whether or not we should open but there ended up being a lot of manipulation and other factors that went in that made it just not a good metric to use overall. You know, maybe we should have been testing a lot earlier, uh, a lot more earlier on. Um, I think that would probably be a good idea, um, but that also is not the panacea to, to make sure that we have a situation where people can be able to live the, their lives as well. But it would have at least given us an opportunity to see what the true uh, situation was back then. Here's hospitalizations, right? So we had a huge spike over the summer. Um, it, it, it is spiking some now, but it's only about two thirds of the way of what it was over the summer, even as cases are, are increasing quite a bit. Still a lot of available hospital beds across the state as well. This next slide is something that I've been tweeting about um, fairly often about the hospitalization in Texas, um, where the hospitalizations, the COVID-19 hospitalizations, the share of total hospital capacity, right? Um, what share is that? And that's the measure that the governor has used as a, as a mechanism or the metric to use of whether or not to open. So those trauma service areas, those TSAs, and you can see how they're broken down there with the main cities being marked there as well. If they've been below 15% for seven straight days, then you can open up to 75% capacity. If you've been above 15% for seven straight days, then you will move back down to a, 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 lower, a lower level of, 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 of or more restrictions, as I'm trying to say. I think it's around 50%. Um, as of right now, there are three trauma service areas that are above 15% for seven more days, almost a month actually, in Amarillo, Lubbock, and El Paso. So if you take the rest of them, uh, the rest of the trauma service areas, their population, as a share of the total population, 94% of Texans are at 75% open, plus some other restrictions like a state, statewide mask mandate things of that nature. So it kind of gives you an idea of where we're at in Texas. Um, but there's still a lot of available bed capacity. When you look at that second to last column, available beds is a percentage of staff inpatient beds. Some places have 20%. Statewide is 19.8%. Some are um, a little bit restrained, right? 11.7% in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. But I think what's important here is hospitals are maximizing their utilization as they've learned over this process. And that goes back to the importance of feedback mechanisms that we often don't have in government, but we can't have within the private sector. And so I think that's something else that we've seen is that these hospitals have been able to better utilize their resources and their beds and everyone else. And I mean, there's been so much strain that's been put on these hospital workers. Um, they've, 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 they've definitely been some heroes throughout this period. Um, and so we need to make sure that we aren't putting more stress on them 
while at the same time looking at the trade-offs that, that are involved. Um, and then this is looking at COVID-19 fatalities in Texas by demographics. Um, you can see the breakdown is 57.7% of them have been male. Um, you look at the race and ethnicity, 54.6% of them have been Hispanic, where Hispanics have about have, have 40% of the overall population of the share of the overall population. It's 50, almost 55% of overall deaths. If you look at the age grouping of fatalities there at the bottom, it's mainly um, you know, those that are over the age of 65 who have been the most vulnerable to, to COVID-19, um, in particular, those that are 80 plus. And so you know, these, I think, give you some idea of where targeting resources to those individuals makes more sense than these blanket sort of policies of lockdowns and, and, and so forth. Um, so you know, it's also important to understand risk, you know, a situation involving exposure to danger. 10.4 million tests have been given in Texas. 3.81% of Texans have been confirmed cases with COVID, right? So, so a little over 96% um, have not had COVID. Uh, the infection fatality rate in Texas is 1.83%, right? So 20,218 deaths compared to the 1.1 million cases um, as of yesterday. So the recovery rate is 98.2%. The fatality rate for all Texans, if you, include, if you say 20,000 over the 29 million Texans, is 0.07%, right? So those help to put this in context of what we're really facing here. We do need to make sure that we're taking on that risk, right? Internalizing it and, and, and making the proper precautions and have an educated risk there, but also don't fall too much into fear at the same time. Having a balance there between these trade-offs is important. And it's also you know, good news that Pfizer um, has picked Texas for a vaccine pilot program to, to, to deliver the vaccine coming up. So that'll be interesting to see what happens there as well. And then finally, this, this last part here is on policies matter, right? Um, policies, policies really do matter. And, and one of the greatest mistakes is to judge policies and programs by their intentions rather than their results, is what Milton Friedman says. But I think it's really clear that puts in the trade-offs that we've been talking about so far. Casey Mulligan at the University of Chicago puts together this nice um, graph that kind of shows the economic cost versus the mortality sort of cost, kind of with the value of the statistical life. And overall, what, it show, what he shows here is that there has been about $2.7 trillion in aggregate economic costs, right? Just kind of mind blowing the effects that this has had. Um, and it's not only just the cost of life from COVID-19, but also the economic costs that this has had on the livelihoods of Americans, right, across the country. And, and this is really broken down to $22,458 per household. So it starts to show you those true trade-offs that's going on there. Um, we've had massive amounts of spending by Congress with multiple relief packages. Um, and, and, and so this by CRFB, they show the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget, they kind of keep track of the legislative action that was taken, the Federal Reserve actions that were taken, and the capacity or the amount that was allowed compared to what's actually been dispersed. And there's still a lot of money that hasn't been dispersed. It's one of the reasons why, in my mind, we shouldn't come up with a author, um, a, a, um, authorizing more spending by Congress for different packages, but instead we should better spend the unspent money that they have already authorized. I think that would be a better approach that's targeted, time, timely, and temporary, kind of like a recovery act that would keep businesses operating and workers working uh, while this is going on instead of, you know, putting in place a situation like the um, Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP, where many of those businesses have now failed, as reported in the Wall Street Journal today. Many businesses, you know, there was also some fraud that was involved. And those are all things that we need to consider because look, government debt is continuing to soar. Not only here in the US, where we're already above 100% of our economic output, but also globally. And each one of those dollars that are being taken out of the private sector and given to the, the, the public sector or the government, right, is a, is a trade off that's, that's there. The Federal Reserve has had a massive increase in their balance sheet, right? And so that has trade offs. And what's going to be the implications for that over time? Uh, I know Alex Salter from Texas Tech gave, recently gave a, a presentation here. I thought he did an excellent job on the monetary policy implications. So I'm not gonna go through all those details, but the effects here of you know, the intentions being different than the results is that we're gonna have massive amount of global GDP lost. They almost negative 4.5% according to um, Statista, right? And, and just a huge amount of economic costs that are there. I'm also gonna have these um, PowerPoints up on, my, up, up on the website for this presentation. So you can look more there as I'm gonna go through these pretty quick here at the end. But the, the real U.S. private GDP, it's a massive loss of about $2 trillion. Some of that has come back. So this is just private GDP. 
um, put it taking away government sector, which is really a drain on the private sector because it has to redistribute those resources, right? And so it still has a ways to go there. Private sector employment, um, we saw a huge drop there. It's come back some, but we still have about 9 million jobs uh, below where we were before. Uh, the unemployment rate, still, you know, 6.9%, still well below the 14.7% that we were at back in April, but well above the 3.5% that we had back in February. The unemployment payments, right, the uninsurance benefits, just massive amount of people that are still in unemployment benefits, shows you the, the human cost that this has had overall. Uh, state and local budgets have, have felt this as well, like we have here in Texas. And I think what, uh, what this show is that we had a massive influx of money that came from Congress and the CARES Act to fund a lot of these state and local governments as their tax revenues were going to be de or were declining. But what happened was is that the, the state and local tax receipts haven't declined by as much as what they otherwise thought. And so the increase by Congress has been much greater overall than the amount that the state and local tax revenues have dipped by. In other words, we don't need another state and local bailout, right? No more money should be given. The states that still have problems should be fine ways for um, spending within their means, cutting their budget, and not putting, not socializing those costs to other states and localities that have done a good job with their overall budget. At the same time, it shouldn't subsidize um, you know, lockdowns or other sort of big government policies that may not be in the best interest of their people. So there's the trade-offs. Um, co effective COVID-19 on states, look, I mean, we were hammered hard in the second quarter. You look at the national, that the nation as a whole, in each one of the states, Texas took a hit of 29%. I'm sure that we're going to have a pretty good bounce back in the third quarter, but that's hard to look back on and say that wasn't a huge hit for our economy. Many businesses have closed. This is closures per 1,000. Texas is right up there in the top 10. We've had, if you look at overall, we've had almost 9,000 businesses that have permanently closed, according to Yelp, and about 6,000 more businesses that could fail here soon. Now, if you were to lock down the United States or the Texas economy now, it'd be many more than that. So th these are huge costs that we're looking at. Private employment in Texas, right, took a huge dip and hasn't come all the way back. So we've still got a ways to go there. Unemployment rate in Texas has, has dipped up, um, sorry, has dipped down compared to the ties, but we're still at 8.3%, which is typically very high during, you know, pretty high during a recession. So overall, look, institutions matter. We need to find ways to strengthen them, to strengthen the core family unit. And, and neighbors and everything else. Eliminate government barriers where we can by reducing government regulations and, and burdensome taxes. Um, and, and let people prosper by giving people a hand up, right, instead of a hand out. And, and thinking about this sort of institutional framework that's gonna be most conducive to prosperity. Um, Trade-offs matter. You know, nothing is free, okay? Uh, when you get, there are educated risks that we can take on, you know, whether it be spending time with your family and friends over Thanksgiving and doing it responsibly. And some may choose not to do that. That should be up to them, weighing their marginal costs and marginal benefits. And, and I think by doing some of those things, we'd be in a better position. And policies matter. You know, I think instead of these blanket policies and things, we need to think about how can we get to a targeted resources um, sort of policy, which we're doing more of that now in Texas by sending resources to certain trauma service areas that are seeing spikes, um, like El Paso, Lubbock, and Amarillo, the governor sent resources to, but I think that should have been done a lot earlier on. Um, and, and by doing something along those lines, we'd be in a much better position, both fis fiscally, the jobs front, and, and, and even I think with the virus itself. Um, we need more timely responses and then to be temporary actions, not permanent things. All these sort of big government policies that have been put in place have to be rolled back eventually, or we're going to remove a lot of our natural right as having liberty. And they should be there to preserve liberty not to infringe upon it. Um, and so I'm going to stop there and hopefully take some, some questions. Um, like I said, it's a really a great honor to be here with you all today. Um, let's see, if, if you would, go ahead and put in the chat box any sort of questions that you may have. Let's see, we have one. Uh, let's see, uh, there's a few here coming up now. So if we develop a vaccine, how long might it take for the U.S. to return back to what we know as normal? Um, so that, that's a great question. So I think what we're, what we're looking at there is what are the effects of the vaccine? And there'll be some interesting insights to see what, how many people will take it, first of all. I think some recent polling has showed that about 60% of Americans are willing to take the vaccine. And a lot of that will be dependent on how safe they feel that it is and things of that nature. Um, but that will be important. But I think it still will take some time, not only for everybody to get the vaccine, 
I know that we, you know, like I said earlier, Pfizer is going to have this pilot program here in Texas. So hopefully we can get that spread out pretty quickly across the state. Uh, but that will help to decrease fear. Um, and, and that will also help to increase confidence and reduce some of the uncertainty that's out there that will allow us to have more economic growth and, and prosperity overall. Um, and so I'm, I'm hopeful that the vaccine will be here sooner rather than later, as I'm sure we, we all are. And, and, and that way we'll have these huge costs to our family and friends and, and, and loved ones um, all across the United States of America. Um, all right, here's another question. Uh, thank you, I keep seeing, sending these in, I love it. Uh, and, and, and I should say it's, it's great to be here with Texas Tech being my alma mater, having this opportunity with the Free Market Institute and being with you all at the Angelo State University. So I, I do appreciate this. Um, so do you believe we'll ever go back to normal, quote unquote normal? Um, whether we get an effective vaccine or not, can social distancing and masks be relevant in the United States even after a vaccine is available? I sure hope that we go back to normal. Um, I remember some of the conversations that I would have at the White House was when we were looking at what are the policy approaches that we want to go moving forward, you know, there was talk about the new normal, quote unquote, new normal. And, and my position was always like, we need to get back to normal. Uh, you know, there is a choice to get to a new normal. We, we can make that choice. Or we can make a choice to say, look, we can get to a normal. And, and I'm, I'm hopeful, you know, given the situation that we're in and given that we are social beings and that we need to have that interaction with one another, not just through Zoom like we are now. This is, this is okay for now. We really need to have that personal interaction there. And so I think that's an essential part of, of us getting back to some sort of normalcy. I think it's also important for kids in school to have in-person instruction and get back into normalcy there, right? That's a huge policy trade-off that I think is ill-advised to not have, people, not have kids there um, in person, given the, the data that's out there and, 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 and weighing those risks. And ultimately, there should be choices, right? You should, as a parent, have the choice of whether or not to send your kids to school. Whether, and, you know, um, and, and, and so I think that's also what we should have um, throughout other things that we're thinking about. And wearing a mask and things of that nature is very important for us to consider what those marginal costs and marginal benefits are. Um, and getting together in, in large groups, we don't necessarily need to be told what to do by those uh, up high, but whether make those decisions rationally on our own. Like we make so many other decisions every day, right? Um, there's so, much, so many risks that we do take, like driving a car, but you still drive a car, right? You, you get out of your house and walk around. I mean, what, I, what, I, what I'm concerned about is the excess risk that people consider with, with COVID. There is a risk, it, it, you know, it's real, and we do need to make sure we take that into account, but also consider the fact that there are trade-offs along the way. Um, and, and hopefully once a vaccine is here, we can get back to a sense of normalcy. I mean, we have had other sort of pandemics and outbreaks, and that has helped to alleviate that and mitigate those concerns and risk and get back to normal. So I'm hopeful that that will be here sooner rather than later uh, to answer your question directly. Um, okay, here's another question. With opportunity costs taken into consideration, the overall death toll is optimally not zero. Why is COVID such a big deal when more people are to die from a car crash on a daily basis than, than the disease? Well, I, I think it ends up, you know, being a, a, a it could be a, a bigger deal, right? Because of the contagion effect that can occur. So in, in a car crash, um, the negative externality, externality are just those that are directly around you. And then if you have that accident, it's just usually you in one other car, maybe a couple of cars. Whereas the effects here can, can, can affect more people with that overall contagion effect, right? So the negative externality can be much greater that you're trying to internalize. In other words, the opportunity cost can be higher. And that's why I've tried to make the point throughout this discussion here this evening to really look at what those trade-offs are and, and be able to consider what the trade-offs, um, what the costs are gonna be. And, and you know, what I, what I also wanna make sure I say is that was the cure worse than the disease, the COVID-19? You know, I, I think it has been overall. I think when you look at the economic costs that it's created and the change in the livelihoods that it's, that, it's, that it's had on people, that there was a better policy approach to take compared to lockdowns. You know, maybe that was the right, thing, right decision in the beginning um, because we didn't know all the information. I, I get that point, uh, but I've also written where it, the shutdown was a mistake. And um, given all the other costs that we've talked about during this discussion, and I think locking down again would be a, a huge mistake as well. That would, the opportunity cost, the marginal cost would be great, much greater 
And, and instead of just looking at how do we target resources to vulnerable populations, allow for people to have a better understanding of the risk and have them make the decision, right, of whether to go out. Um, if they are part of the vulnerable population, it's probably in their best interest to, to not, right? Um, and, and be able to weigh, weigh that overall, which is, doesn't necessarily need the top-down approach of government. Um, and in fact, I think that there's an argument to be made that if the government wants to get more involved with these decisions, they really lack, they, they really lack trust in you, in the public, because they, they're saying, look, we know better, we know what's gonna be better for you because you're not gonna follow these mask mandates, you're not gonna follow what's in the best interest of, of yourself and do these other reckless things. It's going to create a contagion effect, a super spreader event that will then contribute to a, a burden overall. And, and, and look, I just think that that, that, puts, that puts too much power in the hands of government. It's more of a top-down sort of approach. Um, and, and, in, and instead, you know, how do we create these institutional frameworks that allow for people to have, make these, these choices that will be best for them, but also best for us as society as well. And we do that with markets every day, right? When we're buying, when we're buying goods and services and, and some are selling goods and services and, and we trust each other when we're driving a car. Just think about this, when you're driving down a car down the road, um, how much trust you have in those other people that they're not going just to wreck into you. And, and when you go to the marketplace, you have trust that you're buying a valuable product. Because you know why? Because there's a feedback mechanism that says, you know what, if I buy a bad product, well, I won't go back. Um, or I won't buy it and the prices will tend to change over time. And when the government's more involved, whether that be from regulation or higher taxes, or in this case, lockdowns, that feedback mechanism is destroyed, it's distorted, and it creates a situation that makes us potentially worse off overall. And um, you know, I know, I know as we're, we're, we're running out of time here this evening, but, you know, if, if I could just kind of reiterate the key points, you know, for one, institutions matter. Number two, um, we have trade-offs matter. And number three, policies matter. And, and if we can get that across and be able to understand that these are risks that we're taking, I think we can get a, have a more flourishing society and a, a better system of government that's protecting and, pre and preserving our liberty rather than impeding our liberty. And the more that we can do that, I think the, the healthier we'll be, the wealthier we'll be, and the wiser we'll be overall. And, and last thing, make sure that we have that sense of humility. I've given, shared my perspective today. You, I'm sure, have your own, and I love to hear it sometimes. So, so, so Brian, for that, I'm turning it over to you. All right, well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Ginn, for coming out and sharing your perspective with us. Uh, I'm sure we all uh, enjoyed it. There's actually lots of great questions here that we still haven't uh, got to, so I will definitely uh, uh, say to those people that did ask questions that we didn't have the chance to get to, I'm sure it would be okay with you if they reached out to you uh, to get your perspective. Uh, so that's definitely something that they can do. Uh, we're very excited that we got to keep everything going here with the Free Market Institute at Angelo State University, despite everything that happened with COVID. We got to have two, uh, we, feel, we feel very fortunate that we got to have two lectures uh, earlier in the year, and then we were able to find a solution here to still have you come out and uh, share your perspective with us tonight. Uh, so what I want to leave uh, the Angelo State community with uh, is that uh, we're going to continue our programming going on uh, into the next semester. Our next lecture uh, will be at the end of February, where we will, we will have uh, Matt Ridley uh, here to talk about his new book on innovation. Uh, Matt Ridley is a member of the House of Lords of Parliament uh, in, in England, which is a very cool thing. He's also a great author and a great speaker, so it'll be wonderful to have him here. Uh, and we'll just keep uh, adding more programming and doing more things here, uh, especially as things start to get back to normal uh, with the vaccine and everything. So thank you again, uh, Dr. Yen, for coming out. And thank you for everybody that uh, tuned in. And I hope you guys all do well for the students. You do well for finals and you have a wonderful winter break and we'll catch you back up in uh, January.